thank you thank you sir so good evening again we are going to discuss a very very controversial topic it can be either way ecmo in sepsis and sepsis in ecmo because we are always worried about uh, regarding the sepsis for any intensive care unit patient and especially when a patient is on ecmo because we use with so big cannula might have been put in the emergency situation but we are going to discuss how ecmo can be useful during the sepsis in what condition of the sepsis ecmo can be used i have nothing to disclose and as the fear is always in the mind of all intensive care staff ecmo physician initially everybody used to think that possibly sepsis means it's a contraindication for the cannula because the cannula can perpetuate the bacteremia whenever there is a bacteremia the cannula will become a source and uh, this will increase the sepsis they will keep multiplying and you will have a sepsis because oxygenator is a foreign body membrane and there is a plastic tubing so these are the foreign membranes which increases the inflammatory response and that can worsen further worsen the vasodilatory shock and moreover on one end we are using anticoagulant uh, during the ecmo run and the pre existing uh, coagulopath possibly can increase sort of bleeding complication drop in platelets count and other issues but by the end of 1990 several studies have started showing that ecmo can be beneficial in cases of certain subset of the patient who is at risk so we ecmo removes the primary mode of ecmo in those situations especially for the neonatal population and in the pediatric population bb ecmo was restricted only for the hemodynamic stable patient so this is the trend you can see this started in the beginning in the neonatal age group and with a good survival in the late 90s and the early of the 21st century then gradually it switched towards the pediatric population and finally to the adult population with a good amount of survival in the pediatric uh, neonatal pediatric and even in the adult so it is not as good as for the neonatal population but it still with a good survival and if we talk about the also definition of sepsis this is basically a presence of any pathogenic microorganism or its toxin in the blood or the other tissue and which we can diagnose clinically by symptomatic evidence of infection or by lab studies it may also be diagnosed by documented positive culture Uh, and also criteria when we take it is not the success of ECMO is not the discharge of the patient but it is basically separation from it. So what exactly is the sepsis and septic shock? Shock we all know that it's a life-threatening acute circulatory failure with the inadequate tissue oxygenation by the cells. And what we see that these patients are in the vasodilatation in the early phases, having the increasing uh, blood lactate levels. In, Worsening metabolic acidosis, decreasing organ tissue perfusion, and all of the functions gradually starts to deteriorate. Patient will have a decreased urine, uh, urine output, will have a decreased oxygen saturation, will have the alteration of the mentation. All these will happen. And if we talk about the septic shock, that's the most severe manifestation, and mortality can be as high as eighty percent once the multiple organ involvement is there. So what exactly happens once the cells encounter the pathogenic factor of the load of that depends upon the load of the bacteria or pathogenic organism, their virulence and their vascular factor. The host respond depending upon its age, other comorbidities, what medication is, and in which environment the host is, and there will be perturbation, the inflammatory responses, and that. All leads to a leukocyte activation, complement activation, coagulation activation, and ultimately that leads to a cell death. And during the discourse, the there will be imbalance between the anti-inflammatory and inflammatory markers, and there will be neuroendocrine regulation, uh, uh, regulation imbalance. There's impaired functions of the immune cells, and all these actually happens because of a deleterious host response to the infection. And ultimately, clinically, what it basically there will be vasodilatation that will lead to a drop in 
blood pressure and ultimately impaired tissue perfusion and organ perfusion tissue oxygenation will be compromised and that will be added with the loss of barrier functions so there will be a lot of migration of more bacteria and ultimately there will be organ dysfunction and organ pain so when we in precise we talk about the myocardial dysfunction so in the early phases what happened patient is in the vasodilatory shock during the sepsis and they respond very well to the fluid because they are in the low flow state because it is due to the hypovolemia because of shifting of the fluid in the third stage so when we do a volume expansion there is increase in the cardiac output and that improves the patient perfusion temperature but if it is not addressed well the second phase comes when there is a high cardiac output in spite of high cardiac output tissue because of the low systemic vascular resistance there will be tissue perfusion will be compromised and you will see that patient is having a rising lactate levels that means tissue perfusion is compromised and finally in spite of adequate fluid resuscitation and vasopressors and other measures if the disease progresses this leads to a reduction in the cardiac output and there will be as a compensatory mechanism there will be increased systemic vascular resistance and that will further worsening the tissue perfusion and metabolic acidosis so if you see in the acute phase uh, there will be the drop in the ejection fraction but when there comes the recovery phase then probably the myocardial contact rate improves and the ejection fraction improves so in the early phases of the cardiac dysfunction usually it will remain unnoticed in the early phases though there is always a difference in intrinsic myocardial performance it is uh, unmasked when there is a problem of the preload and afterload or it can lead to cardiac failure if imbalance between the preload and afterload is not matched though it is reversible so if treated well it will reverse very quickly then in almost 50% patient they will encounter lv diastolic dysfunction while the rv systolic dysfunction will also happen especially in those patients who develop acute uh, lung injury or ardios in almost 30 to 50% of patients so in the different category uh, of the age group there will be different manifestation like in newborn we may have the persistent pulmonary hypertension which are the right heart failure which can be a initial sign of a sepsis while in fact you will see that the left ventricular function is impaired and there is a low cardiac output while in the big children and adult the initial phase you will have the vasoplegia or distributive shock with a high output in the initial phases and once the shock progresses it there will be a low cardiac output so how ecmo can be helpful in this one it will give a temporary cardiovascular support it can give a temporary lung support also in the patient where there is a gas issue and secondly it is going to because it is improving perfusion so it can prevent further organ damage and it can support the kidney as well by improving the oxygenation tissue perfusion and put in the during the bleeding it also helps in the diluting the cytokines and it can provide a platform to other therapies like the use of azirels or cytosol the r crr to increase the toxicity but remember again it's not a treatment for sepsis it is only going to help if we are using the bva for it is going to improve the gas exchange in cases of severe lung failure secondary to the sepsis or peripheral bva for which is going to provide the circulatory support however it may or may not match with the need of the body and central uh, ba echo which can provide the both circulatory and respiratory support but issue is it needs so not me and most of these patients they will have already the progression of the malady that the more risk of bleeding and death so in which manifestation of the sepsis actually echo can be so there two important manifestation of sepsis where echo can be helpful one is the severe ard where in spite of all the manuals including the high ventilatory setting your patient is not able to maintain oxygenation and work of breathing is increasing your compliance is getting down and it is difficult to ventilate these patients in, in spite of proning and other manner so those severe ard patients this is one subset of the patient and second subset of the patient who are having cardiac myocardial dysfunction they are having a hemodynamic stability in spite of adequate fluid and high vasopressors and they have the severe myocardial dysfunction so we
which type of ECMO in which condition. This is very important that we understand it. If a patient has developed a septic shock and he is on the high vasopressors, norepinephrine, vasopressins, or other vasopressors, so we do any. This is important to differentiate that what exactly how we should choose the ECMO patient. So if there is a RV failure and patient is having PRDS, then possibly only supporting the VV ECMO may improve the pH, gas exchange, as well as reduce the peak inspector pressure. But if the RV failure is persisting, then probably you may need to put an arterial canal and we have to convert to a hybrid ECMO as a VEA. The other patient who is having an LV failure, those patients you rule out the coronary issue. By doing the ECG, you look at the troponin and coronary has been ruled out. It means it is the cardiac myocardial dysfunction because of the sepsis itself. And we choose these patients for a VA course. And if patient simultaneously develops the ideas and with the VA form, which can provide both cardiac and respiratory support, if still patient is not able to maintain his or her saturation, then probably we have to move over to the hybrid ECMO by placing another venous cannula and converting VA ECMO to VA VA. The third category of the patient who are having a normal ejection fraction or even the hyperdynamic circulatory state are high rejection fraction and their myocardial function, myocardium is hyperkinetic. In those patients, possibly ECMO may not be helpful because the needed cardiac output may not match with the peripheral VA ECMO and in those conditions possibly we may need to do a, a central cannulation in this patient. So when we do a VA ECMO and supports the heart, it provides both cardiac and respiratory support and it can reduce the right ventricular preload oxygen. And there is no risk of recirculation, so you are not worried about the oxygenation and there is a better oxygen delivery. But the problem is you are increasing the afterflow. So LV is already having a dysfunction and if you are increasing the afterflow, then there is a possibility that there can be LV distension and uh, difficulty in recovery. Now, if there is LV distension, there will be a low pulse pressure and probably a perfusion may be a problem. And if these patients are having a simultaneous ARDS, then possibly coronary oxygenation or a cerebral oxygenation is always an issue. Because of this, there can be a myocardial stunning and there may be a uh, altered cerebral pulmonary regulation. If you talk about a VV echo, here we are not doing any arterial cannulation, so a lot of major complications can be avoided. We can provide direct pulmonary oxygenation, and definitely it is not going to affect any cardiac part of pulmonary oxygenation. Neurological complications are relatively lower, and we maintain the patient's cardiac output and pulse because arterial side we are not affected. And even a moderate amount of vasopressors are not a contraindication for doing a VDN. But the problem is oxygen delivery may not be sufficient and it is not providing any cardiac support and there is always a risk of recirculation. In the neonate, as I said, survival is almost 80% uh, with an indication of respiratory or circulatory failure. VA ECMO used to be preferred in the neonate by using the carotid ventricular, but VV cannulation with a single cannula is also getting popular. And the uh, uh, recent guidelines also uh, recommend the use of ECMO in the refractory shock. Similarly, in the chair, young child, ECMO is rather, uh, it is being used, but it's still not as good survival as in case of units. Again, the guidelines are suggesting to use of ECMO in the refractory shock once you have ruled out other causes um, for evaluating a peri, removing, excluding the pericardial efficient pneumothorax and maintaining an intra-abdominal pressure less than 12 millimeter of mercury, then definitely if the patient is not uh, maintaining saturation or having a refractory shock, then we need to support this patient from that. In adults, in the past it was a poor outcome, but recent literature is definitely encouraging. However, we need a larger study. This is one of the study where the survival was poor in the category of the patients who were supported with the VEFO with the use of uh, in cases of septic shock, as compared to the non-septic patients who were supported in VA. So the author concluded that the pre-existing sepsis is not a contraindication. However, VA ECMO should be used with the caution, um, especially uh, if the patient is having active sepsis. However, this is a study where the 14 patients who had the 
um, adult patient who had a sepsis suspected cardiac failure, they showed a very good outcome of 10 survivors, almost 71% patient who discharged. So if you look at the data on these patients, they started ECMO pretty early since the admission of these patients. None of these patients had the cardiac arrest, and all these patients had the low cardiac output, cardiac index, um, and it was the myocardial dysfunction with the elevated SPR was the, uh, their um, EPO profile. So possibly this is a subset of the patient who, if we choose, then possibly we can have a very good outcome. And even these patients did not have, uh, if you look at the, their renal profile, only 60% patient required a uh, renal placement therapy as compared to the 100% of the non-survivor group. Then possibly adding another organ dysfunction increases the mortality by almost 10%. Probably that may also be a reason. So in these group, two, uh, 10 patients had long-term survival by two, four deaths in the ICU, two under ECMO, and two after the ECMO. So if you look at the outcome in the sepsis, we have the vast difference. Uh, however, in the neonatal population, it's a very good outcome as compared to the adult population. So how do we do the ECMO calculation? We know venous, there is no problem. You look at the ARDS and you do uh, we know venous cannulation in the conventional method by doing a femoral, a femoral jugular. However, if there's a right heart failure or pulmonary hypertension, then definitely you have to look for putting in an arterial cap. VA code, which is necessary for the myocarditis without distributive shock. If high flow is needed, then central cannulation, otherwise peripheral VA code using a femoral femoral group may be sufficient. And VAV, when you require both cardiac and pulmonary support with myocardial functions are improving, our decision is there, and along with the ARDS, so upper body hypoxemia is possible, and in those conditions, you have to support with the PAPK. So this is the different age group and how the calibration options are there. If there is a right heart failure in the neonatal population, then possibly a VV echo. While in young children, if there is a left heart failure, then peripheral V echo using a carotid or femoral route. And if there is a distributive shock in the older child, then central V echo may be a good option. And make sure in any age group, central VFO has been preferred, but we should always keep in mind that doing a sternotomy may be a cause of massive bleeding and media spine. So the risk and benefit we have to see that we have to do is to not be those things. Advantage of central condition as said, you can achieve a higher flow of as much as 10 liters per minute. So the maldistribution possible can be avoided and you can achieve a complete Cardiopulmonary support, you don't need to worry about the upper body hypoxemia because you are providing a complete support. So this is the different uh, age, uh, depending on the patient, age, different size of the cannula and how much flow we can achieve by placing this cannula in this dental cannula. There are certain predictors like uh, if the SAPS score is less than 80, the chances better in an adult patient. Uh, gram positive uh, infection, if ECMO is supported, then possibly the outcome is better. Due to ECMO time, if it is the shorter, then possibly the outcome is better. However, uh, if uh, age is above 60, then chances of survival is definitely less. In the children, if the pH is uh, less than 7.2 or PCO2 is higher, or GCS is low, uh, then possibly their uh, chances outcome is not as good as compared to the, if they have the less so high score of less than 15, or we are trying for central calculation so we can achieve a good. But there are certain unanswered questions. We still need to work on this, that any particular pathology, a pathological pattern, where it is can get benefit. Though we know that the low cardiac output and ARD is the indication, but in which subset of the patient, where it will be actually beneficial, we don't. And if we combine this ECMO with the other adjunctive therapy of CRRT or uh, using of the uh, these uh, auxiliaries or uh, uh, other filters, how much echo flow is required? So, is the central V echo is better to us? What should be opt optimal level of anticoagulation if the patient is developing a DIC? And how to address the polarization issue because we are always worried about the sepsis dissemination and how this. Tissue and oxygen kinetics happens during the ectoral. All these questions are still to be answered. But one thing we can say, yes, ECMO can improve survival in the 
specific subset of the patient who are having septic shock, especially for AIDS, as well as patients having a myocardial dysfunction with a low cardiac output. They will be definitely benefited. However, there is no universally accepted criteria when ECMO should be initiated. Fundamentally, if tissue oxygenation delivery cannot be maintained despite optimal ventilation, vasopressors, and intravenous fluid, then probably ECMO should be important. Central condition may be better, but to achieve a high flow. But whether it will affect the outcome, it is split down. Thank you very much. Any question or any comment? Thank you, Vivek. There's one question in the chat box. Uh, what do you mean by central cannulation if ECO so good EF in septic shock? Yeah. If there is a good ejection fraction in septic shock and is still the tissue perfusion is compromised and which is very common in the vasodilatory shock that even the cardiac output is 10 liter or 8 liter if you monitor the cardiac output, ejection fraction is looking 60% but is still patient is worsening and there is a metabolic acidosis and lactates are rising. That means the body is not Whatever the cardiac output is there, it is not matching with the tissue perfusion. So in those conditions, possibly, I, there, if you look at the uh, graph, there is a query that possibly it may be beneficial. Yes, still, nobody has answered for this. But yes, why we are worried, if you look at the uh, other vasodilatory shock, like in the dengue shock syndrome, why ECMO doesn't help them? 